My name is Justin Buzzard, and like Gage said, I'm a pastor. Uh, that's what I do for work. Live in Silicon Valley, love it. There, started a church seven years ago. We had three people in three thousand dollars in this dream of doing something fresh and new, planning a church that would engage our city with the gospel in a new way. And I love it. Love I love what I do there. So, hey, what's the question that adults ask when they first meet each other? You probably asked it of people when you first came in here. What do you do? Yeah, what do you do? And I just kind of answered that question for you. I've told you what I do. Now, that's relatively new in human history. Maybe only in the last hundred or so years has that kind of been a big question that adults ask of each other. Uh, the question used to be different. The question used to center more on your parents. So here, here's what I want to do before I continue. I want you to talk to the neighbor next to you and share what your mom and dad do or, or if your parents have passed what they did. Would you just take 30, 60 seconds and share that with your neighbor? Okay, I, I've got to cut you short. I've got to cut you short on that. But uh, see how that feels a little bit different when you're sharing not, not what you do, but what your parents do or, or, or did? It, it, almost, it takes you a little bit deeper into who someone is and into someone's, into someone's story. So I told you what I do. I'm a pastor. I'm an author. Uh, let me tell you about my parents, what they do. I'm the son of Ron and Joan Buzzard. Uh, I grew up in originally a blue-collar family. My dad was a truck driver. Uh, but when I was three years old, our home was robbed, and my dad was furious over this. Our home was robbed. Everything was taken. My piggy bank was even smashed and taken. Uh, they took everything. And so my dad on the weekend started learning about how alarm systems work because he had this passion to protect people and he didn't want other people to experience what he and his family had experienced. So he started on the side, this alarm company that then grew, this entrepreneur it grew and it, and it took off and then ran a very successful alarm company in Sacramento, California. Uh, my mom was helping my dad in that business, then later went to school and got her master's in marriage and family uh, therapy and went on to be a marriage and family therapist. Um, and she passed away, uh, sadly, of cancer five years ago. Now, my work is deeply shaped by my parents' work. That entrepreneurial side of my dad and that very caring, nurturing, counseling, pastoral side of my mom has really shaped what I do as a church planter and as a pastor. And one of the things I want to do in this, in this talk, and I don't really know what, it, what this is today. This is like a talk, or it's a sermon, or it's a, it's a mix of both. I'm not really sure. I, I'm, used to, I'm used to preaching. But I, I want us to wake up to a deeper history that is shaping your work, and that is shaping the way in which people go about work in Los Angeles, a deeper history that shaped the, this, this city. Um, and I want to go even deeper than, than our parents. I want to go back to a deep, uh, ancient, and very much still alive framework for understanding our work. So I want to give us today five pillars for better making sense of our work that I think if we could be more awake to these pillars, it would result in more flourishing. It would result in this city prospering. Uh, more fully and rejoicing more fully. So here's the first pillar. The first pillar, God the worker. The first pillar is God the worker. Okay, the first words of anything are very important. The first words of a, of a book, first words of uh, opening lines in a movie are very important. Uh, these are the first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Notice what that does not say. It doesn't say, in the beginning, me. In the beginning, you. It says, in the beginning, God. So we've got to start all of our thinking there when it comes to all of life and when it comes to work. In the beginning, God. And then notice the, the, the fifth word then. What, what, what's the word that comes after this? Created. So already we're making some connections with Los Angeles and the kind of work that is done here. So much of the work here is creative work. Already there's great connections to be made. In the beginning, God, God created. And the first thing we learn about God is that he's a worker. It's the first thing we encounter God doing is he's working. If you're starting looking at the Bible for the very first time, you go, oh, this God, he's a worker. He's, he's working. And think about all the different fields in which God is working. Uh, he, he starts working. He's in, he's in astronomy as he is putting the stars in the sky. He's in marine biology, uh, putting fish in the sea. He's involved in landscaping and gardening and, and forming this garden. He's a zookeeper working with animals. He's, he's a script writer, you could say, as he creates humans in a story in which for them to 
live. Uh, he's doing legislation, laws for humans, uh, venture capital, giving humans resources to steward. He's an entrepreneur. He's an electrician. Let there be light. And what I want to say is that, and it's a big claim, but I think nobody in Los Angeles can properly understand the dignity, the value, the potential impact of their work unless they can make this connection, unless they can understand that God is a worker, unless they can understand the delight that God has in working. Um, they need to make those, make those connections. Um, so like I, I, uh, we recently, my family and I, two months ago, we bought a house, which is a huge deal in Silicon Valley to, to do that. I know you think homes are very expensive here in Los Angeles. Uh, we think they're super cheap compared to Silicon Valley. So m- median price of a home right now in Silicon Valley is $1.3 million. Uh, in- incredibly expensive. So we bought this home. We bought a home. It was built in 1939. And it, we bought it, and a bunch of things have gone wrong with it. And... <laughs> And, and so what we have needed to do is we've needed to really understand the history of this home in order to take good care of it. And here's what's really great. There's four boys that grew up in this, in this home. Uh, the, the last owner had it for 50 years, ra- ra- raised her sons in the, in the home. One of the sons lives two doors down. The other son lives on the street behind us. Two other sons live just a few miles away. And so whenever things kind of go wrong in the house, we call these sons. And, it's, and they, they love it. They love, they love helping us. They know everything. And we've had to learn all these different things about the house. And as as we've learned the history of this house, we've learned how to better steward this house. We've learned how to better take care of it. We've learned how to better enjoy it. And that's what I want us to do in understanding work. We've got to understand this history that has been been shaping us. Now, we could have taken this house. uh, We didn't have the money to do this or anything, but like we could have bulldozed the house and then built a new house. That would have been something totally different. That would have been ignoring the history, bulldozing the history, not paying attention to the history, and just doing our own thing. In many ways, that's what a lot lot of people have done with work in Los Angeles. They've ignored the history, this deep and ancient history, shaped by the living God, communicated to us through his word, and they've just tried to kind of carve out their own way and their own path with work. And we want to recover this this history and understand it. So let's let's talk second about the second pillar. Uh, Let's talk about a definition of human work and the danger of human work. Definition of human work and the danger of human work. Work is a huge, huge part of our lives. So at what age did you, did you guys start working? Let's hear some ages. 15. 15. Okay, I was, I was 52. I started working at age 15 as a busboy at a restaurant. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you're like me, you started working at age 15, maybe you think, hey, I'll work till I'm 70 or something like that. You're going to be working for 55 years. And so you, you need to, we need to really understand it. It's such a huge part of our lives. Um, the climax Go to Genesis, you look at the climax of God's first work week. The climax of that is creating humans. God creates humans in his image, and he creates them to work. Let's, let's look at a very, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible, in my opinion. Genesis 2.15, let's, let's look at this verse. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Everybody say work it. And keep it. Everybody say keep it. Okay, these are the two Hebrew verbs uh, avad and shamar. Avad, translated work it, uh, is, is a richer, even bigger word. means to cultivate, to cultivate the garden. Um, and shamar, keep it, is, is a rich word that means to protect it, to guard it. So God gives uh, the first humans this job description to cultivate and guard the garden so that those humans and so that others can flourish in the garden. Take this garden, take this place where you are, cultivate it, cause life to flourish, and guard it, and and protect it. And I really think that what God is giving us here is a paradigm for understanding human work. He's beginning to give us a definition, a paradigm, a framework for understanding human work. So I'm going to give you today a two-part definition of human work. And here's the first part of the definition. Uh, Work is cultivating the raw materials of a particular domain for the flourishing of others. Work is cultivating the raw materials of a particular domain, a particular field, for the flourishing of others. And and, and so you can understand that all work is like gardening. It's like gardening. So if if, if you're a songwriter in Los Angeles, you, you are working with notes with melody, with words, and you're putting that together, and you're, you're turning chaos into order. 
so that other people would enjoy this song and be, and be moved. You're doing the same thing if you're a screenwriter with, with words. You're doing the same thing if you're, my church is Silicon Valley, my church is all engineers. You like throw a rock, you hit an engineer in our church, like everyone's just an engineer. And that's what our engineers in Silicon Valley are doing, is they are making sense out of math and code and putting it together so other people would flourish. That's what a stay-at-home mom is doing, is, is taking a, a home and these kids and this and that and putting together a schedule and putting together discipline and putting together order. Um, but but let's, there's more for us to see about work. I, I want to back up in Genesis a little bit. Here's our, here's our next text, Genesis uh, 2, uh, verse 7 to 8, and we'll jump back to 15. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And now back to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Pay attention to that word put. Um, God is the master in this relationship. Very important that you understand this. God is the master in this relationship, and the master put the servant into the garden and told him his will, revealed his will to him. His will is to work, and that word can also be translated, you know, cultivate, also is serve, to serve and to keep the garden. So in, in this master-servant relationship, we must understand the master-servant relationship today. Uh, the master's job, the master's responsibility is to give the servant everything he needs to do his will. The master is there to resource Adam, to care for Eve, to give them everything they need to do his will. The servant's only responsibility is to be faithful and obedient. The master gives everything. The servant's responsibility as a worker is to be faithful, obedient, to work, to do his job. So God created the garden. God did all that. He created the garden. He took the man from where he was, and he put him in the garden. Uh, God sent sunshine and rain and the, and the climate onto the garden. And, and the human is not responsible to do the master's job. The human is not responsible to be God. The human is not responsible to do what only the master is responsible to do. He's not designed, humans are not designed to carry that load, to carry the master's load. And if we want to start to understand the core, I think, of stress in our lives and of sin in our lives, a, a lot of it is getting this master-servant relationship wrong. And there's a lot of pride in that, a lot of brokenness in that. But it's thinking that we're supposed to do the master's job, and it's forgetting that we are human, meant to fully trust our master. So here's part two of this work definition, here, part two of our definition of work here. It's faithfully serving. I think, we, do we have a slide for this, part two of this definition? Maybe we don't. Uh, it's faithfully serving where the master has put you and promises to resource you. Part two of this definition. Faithfully serving where the master has put you here in Los Angeles and where he promises to resource you. We must be awake to, we must never forget that God cares about you. He cares about your work. He cares about what you do. He cares about your city far more than you ever could. God cares about your work far more than you ever could. And that is... Uh, I, f I find that immensely, immensely freeing. Do you, do you guys believe that? A couple, like three of you here do. <laughs> so like, believe that. God cares about you. He cares about your work. He cares about your city far more than you ever could. And that should free you. That's one of my hopes from this, this talk, sermon, whatever this is. is. That you would feel more freedom. That God would start to get a little bigger in your vision, in your life. So what, what does this look like? I mean, in the Bible, it looks like Nehemiah, who's got this God-given burden to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, he goes, he works with all his heart, he goes and he gets supplies and he talks to the king and he, and he, and he does all his work, but ultimately he's praying. And he's just praying. He knows that it's not going to work unless God shows up and God provides. We're facing a situation in our church right now uh, where, man, I have no idea, I have no idea what to do. Um, keep this confidential until tomorrow because we're going to tell our church about this tomorrow. If you know anyone in my church, <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone until tomorrow. So we moved our church, we outgrew our last space, we moved our church uh, 
uh, one year ago to this new space that we're in. It's a bigger space of our church, uh, a place where we believe we would really flourish. And what we had negotiated here in our, in our lease is that there would just be a moderate increase of our rent in year, in year two. Um, making a long story short, what, what we were told just a few weeks ago is that our rent needs to go up now by 60%, which is just totally, exactly. It's exactly what I said. Uh, just ludicrous. And so the elders of our church, we've been just trying to sort this out, trying to figure this out. We've been praying. We've been mad. We've been dis- disappointed. We've been like kind of battling this out with the folks that we rent from. And so what we're going to do this Sunday after I get done preaching is we're just going to tell the church what's going on, and we're going to say we have no idea what to do. All we know what to do is, is we're going to pray. Let's, church, let's take a week. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's see what God wants to do. Um, because ultimately it's his church. Our church is his church. He cares about it more than we ever could. And so, yes, we as humans in my, my church, we've got to work. We've got to figure things out. We've got to check out some other locations. We've got to price things out. We've got to figure it out. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we've got to say, God, you're the main worker here. Show up. Show up. Help. Provide. We need to have that spirit in our work, understanding about humor. But see, human work, there's also, we gave a, I gave a definition, there's also a danger here in human work. Uh, have you noticed in the Bible that as sin enters the world, the sin, the fall, Genesis 3, so much of that has to do with work. And it, and it brings brokenness to our work. You, you got to understand sin also through this lens of work. Look, look at our definition. When you see that sin that happens in the garden, a lot of it is a breakdown of the second definition I gave you, is, is those humans did not trust God. It's a breakdown of the master-servant relationship. They didn't trust God, that God was for them, and that, that God wasn't withholding anything from them. And they went and they ate from the tree, and they weren't trusting God to care for them. And it's also a breakdown of definition number one. Is they didn't guard the garden. Adam, Adam didn't guard the garden from the, from the serpent and from his false words and from his lies, and, and, and didn't protect the garden and didn't protect his, protect his wife. So then God brings thorns into the garden. The th- work is so profoundly affected by this sin. Thorns into the garden, and that is what results in the different tendencies we see in our cities. Some people bent towards overwork. Other people's bent, bent towards underwork. Um, most everyone bent towards just a, a total brokenness of this master-servant relationship. And, and what happens is when a city of people begin to operate in this way, when a whole city full of people, are, their, their work is not connected to God, not understanding God as the great worker, not under master-servant relationship, it results in this. Uh, Genesis 11, verse 4. You know this, Tower of Babel. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. That makes a lot of sense, I think, out of what goes on in Los Angeles and what goes on in Silicon Valley. Let's make a name for ourselves. We no longer want to make God's name great because we perfectly trust him and we know that his glory is ultimate. We want to make a name for ourselves. It affects the whole city. So this explains so much of today, what you see in Los Angeles, different tensions in your particular workplace. The tensions in my heart, we're all tempted towards that to make a name for ourselves. And the tensions in your heart. So we need help. When we're humans just stuck in this, that, that's not going to go very well. So we need some help. That, that's how you become a Christian. Is you're like, I, I need some help. That's how you keep growing in the Christian life. I need some help. So let's go number three to Jesus at work. This is the third pillar, Jesus at work. Jesus at work. So there's a scene in the Bible where Jesus is doing some amazing things. He's healing people. He is teaching with profound authority, and people are just amazed and astonished at this. Uh, Yet they say this of of Jesus, uh, Matthew 13. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? It's interesting, Jesus is known right there in the same way in which we introduced ourselves here, kind of based on our parents' work. That's how Jesus was known. He was known as the carpenter's son. He's known as the son of Mary. It's a very ancient way in which people were, were known. Um, but it's also the work that Jesus did. If we look at a parallel passage, Mark 6, 3, Mark puts it a little bit differently. Uh, 
Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And Jesus, Jesus was a carpenter. Isn't that interesting? That the son of God, the son of God adds humanity to his divinity and comes to earth as a worker. He's, he's where, I mean, when we first meet God in the Bible, he's working. When we first meet the Son of God here in the Bible, we, we discover his, he's working. He's a, he's a carpenter, working with his hands to make stuff, uh, cultivating the raw materials of a particular domain for the flourishing of others, building tables, building chairs, building homes. I don't know what all Jesus built. And then I find this very interesting. When Jesus first begins his ministry, his three-year ministry, uh, where does Jesus first show up? Where does he first show up? Mark chapter 1. Where does Jesus first show up? Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net uh, into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus first shows up at someone's workplace. And G- G- Jesus shows up where Simon and Andrew were working. He, he goes to their workplace. And he, he first calls his disciples from their workplace. And the way in which Jesus makes sense of what he wants them to become is through the lens of their workplace. I'm going to make you become fishers of men. He, he He's giving so much dignity to their work. He's showing up at their work. So I've got the title to this talk is Going to Work Confident God is at Work. And I mean that at in two different ways. And this is the first way in which I mean that at. Confident that God is there. I want you to go to work confident God is there. God is there. He's at your workplace. God, in the Bible, God's showing up working and he's showing up at workplaces. I wonder how... Jesus might want to show up at your workplace this week. I wonder what his presence showing up in your workplace might might say to you. I mean, Jesus is the one who taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And when Jesus is is, is praying that, when when we are praying that, it's not just, okay, God, magically give us our daily bread. It's, okay, well, there's the farmer cultivating the, the fields. And there's the truck driver hauling the, I don't know how that works, hauling the grain to wherever the grain goes. And to the baker baking the bread and the person taking it to the grocery store, the coffee shop where you get the, get the bread. All, all kinds of workers are involved in the answer to that prayer. The Lord giving us our daily bread. Um, this is one of the reasons, one of the things I love to do as a pastor I, I love to visit people at their workplace. Uh, I, I do this, I do this, I've been doing this for, I don't know, over 10 years now. Um, I, I first did it because I was working at a church office at, my, at the church I worked at before starting our church, and I hated being there. I hated being at this church office because uh, Sundays were so much fun. You're with everybody. It's, just, it's so fun. Then I go to my office on Monday, and like, no one was there, and I'm an extrovert, and I just, I, it was so boring. And so I just started going to visit people at their workplace. I, it wasn't because of great theological reasons. It was just because I was bored. <laughs> and I went there, and I started seeing how much this meant to people in my church. And I started being with them at their workplace, see, seeing where their cubicle is, meeting their coworkers, eating lunch there. And they almost, almost all of them just told me, like, no one has ever visited me at work. Nobody, I, I've worked here for 10 years. And nobody has ever visited me here. Even my spouse has never visited me here. My best friend's never visited me here. Thank you, pastor, for visiting me at my work. And so I make that a regular thing now. Um, average week, two, three times a week, I'm with someone in their workplace. And that's where, that's where my people are spending so much of their lives. That's where they are making so much of their impact in our city, is in their workplace. And we do these interviews um, at our church around once a month where we just have someone get up for, and they just answer three questions. Uh, hey, what do you do? They talk, they talk to us about their work. Uh, second, what's something you love about your job? We talk about it. Third, what's something in your job that's kind of challenging right now where we could pray for you? And it just takes four or five minutes in a worship service and we do it. And we just, our church gets a picture of the workplaces in which Jesus has put us. 
in our city. Jesus at work. Jesus shows up at work. Let's talk fourth about this pillar. The finished work of Jesus. The finished work of Jesus. Have any of you ever felt like your work is finished? Have you like ever had that feeling? I, I never have that feeling. Oh my gosh, I, I'm sure your work is, is similar to mine in many ways. Like my work as a pastor, like I don't ever feel like I'm done. Like there's always more sanctification that needs to happen in someone's life. It's, it's never like, I'm done. Like I figured it out. That I don't need to be a pastor anymore. I mean, I realized a few years ago, I will die with unfinished work. I need, I'm going to die with unfinished work. So I better figure out how to rest, how to be happy in the midst of a big pile of unfinished work. Jesus helps us with this. Uh, there's two places in the Bible where it says that God finished his work. First is in the very beginning of the Bible on the seventh day. It said that God finished his work and he rested from all the work that he had done. Soon after, not long after that, uh, the first humans broke relationship with God. They broke relationship with God and they broke this master-servant relationship and, and thereby, they broke the relationship we're meant to have with work. In breaking relationship with God, our relationship with work got out of whack. And so, all of a sudden, chaos just kind of entered the world. And there's this relationship with work is busted. The master-servant relationship is busted and flourishing is not happening. And so the humans start playing the master role, almost thinking of God as their servant. And get it backwards. And so it's years later, it's years after this, that Jesus enters our world. And Jesus is a servant serving his master. So he's not just the carpenter's son. He's, he's the son of a different father that goes way, way, way back. He's the son of his heavenly father. That's his truest source of identity. That's his master. And Jesus is put... Adam was put in the Garden of Eden. Jesus is put in the Garden of Gethsemane by his master. And Jesus, as you know, as he's contemplating the work that he's about to do, and as he's praying, as he's interceding, he just starts sweating blood because this work that is before him, and he knows how significant it is and how stressful it is and how weighty it is. And Jesus goes and he does his work. And there he goes, he goes on a cross and hanging on that cross, bleeding on that cross, working on that cross. Jesus is there dying for your sins, your wounds, our messed up relationship with God and our messed up relationship with work. This master-servant relationship that's gotten out of whack. And he cries there at the very end from the cross, it is finished. And I, and I don't know how he said it. How was his breath at that point in time and energy? Just was it, it is finished. Or was it a loud cry, it is finished. What is finished? What does he mean? Jesus means this broken relationship with God and this broken relationship with work is finished. Babel has been reversed. We no longer are to be a people that need to make a name for ourselves. We understand that the Son of God has come for us and has worked for us. We understand how valued we are by God, how forgiven we are by God, how loved we are by God, and now we're a people free to just work for the glory of God, not for our own glory or to try to justify ourselves to God. I, when I got done preaching that section of the Gospel of John years ago, um, I went out and kind of got a tattoo of that, of that verse. And, and this is my tattoo, and this is a, if you can see it, this is a, a cross, but it's, a, it's an anchor cross. The earliest Christians in the catacombs would often disguise the cross as an anchor cross cross as a way of communicating the message of the gospel without being kind of noticed. And it's the word tetelestai, the Greek word, it is finished. 
And this is a reminder to me that I am an unfinished man with an unfinished life and a massive pile of unfinished work resting in the finished work of Jesus. What would it look like in Los Angeles with a coworker or two in your workplace, if more and more people in Los Angeles were doing their work from a place of resting in the finished work of Jesus? How would that transform you? How would that transform the culture in your workplace? How could that transform this city? Let's talk fifth about the ongoing work of Jesus. The ongoing work of Jesus. We need to deeply emphasize the finished work of Jesus. I mean, it's, it's tattooed on my body. But let's not stop there. Let's, let's, let's not stop there. Um, Jesus finished the work of salvation, uh, but Jesus is still working. He's still working. G the resurrected and ascended Jesus poured out his Holy Spirit and the, to empower God's people. And, and so much of the rest of the New Testament is the New Testament shouting at us that God is with you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus is still working. God is with you. God is for you. God's at work. God's at work. This master-servant relationship has been restored, and we can enter into that freedom of being servants who are just faithful and obedient, trusting our master to guide us and provide for us and resource us in our work. So a final verse for us to look at today, Ephesians 2.10. Hopefully you know this well. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice first the word his. We are his. I'm going to assume this is a room full of believers. We are his. This, this, this verse is not just saying who we are, but whose we are. We are his. You go to work this Monday with an invisible his sign across your chest. You're his. You belong to him. And, and you're his workmanship. And you know this, this, this is the Greek word poema, which means masterpiece, a work of art. You're, you're his masterpiece. You're a work of art. You know, atheism says something very different. Atheism says you're an accident. And therefore, the logical extension of that is your work is, is pretty darn meaningless. And LA-ism says you are your own workmanship. You're making a name for yourself. Your identity comes through achievement. And that's the only thing that gives you your, your true value, your true sense of worth. What an immense burden that is to live under. But the New Testament says something very different and so very freeing. You are his workmanship. You're his masterpiece. Before you even lift a finger, before you even do any work, before you even get out of bed, you're his masterpiece. So could I just give you a new word for yourself today? You're his masterpiece. You're stunning. And, and you're, you're all a unique masterpiece of the living God. How much glory we give him as we understand the unique masterpiece we are. And we don't try to be anyone else, but we just be who God created us to be. I was watching recently uh, with my sons. I have three boys, three sons. They're so much fun, 12, 10, and 8. And we were watching this. I think it was Planet Earth. Um, it was uh, all about Komodo dragons. And uh, I don't know, has anyone seen this recently with Planet Earth, this Komodo dragon thing? Oh my, find it. I think it was Planet Earth. Find it. Watch it tonight. It is literally the best TV I have seen in 10 years. Like the be 
it was incredible. It was, I don't know how they got this footage, but these creatures were incredible. And you, just, you watch them first, you watch the adults, adult Komodo dragons fi- fighting with each other. And that was unbelievable. And the tails, they wag and how they fight was unbelievable. But then there's this epic scene like the baby Komodo dragons are getting hatched out of these eggs and they're making a run for cliffs by the beach while I don't know where they come from. These killer snakes come out of nowhere and try to kill the baby Komodo dragons. And it's just, it is, it's incredible. And they're, the, the dragons are like running and the snakes are after them. And like, we were on the edge of our seats. My boys are like, who's, are they going to get the Komodo dragons? And, they, and some win and some don't. And it was, it was just riveting. I'm just like, whoa. But the Bible never says that Komodo dragons are God's masterpiece, are God's work of art. It says that creative, created and redeemed humans are. And it's as, though, it's as though the Komodo dragons really want to be watching TV of you. You at work. You going to your workplace on Monday and doing your work, making good products, whatever it is that you do, doing it for the glory of God. They want to see Thursday night sitting in my house. There's a bunch of leaders in my house. And one of the, from our church, one of the, one of the leaders, Kevin, High up at Apple, works on secret stuff, can't talk about it. But he was talking, he writes code all day, does stuff in, on the computer, and he was sharing his passion. He's like, I want God to be specifically glorified in my workplace. He said, I want to keep doing great work, I want to do great stuff for Apple, but I want God's name to be specifically glorified in my workplace. And I'm praying that God would help me do that through my actions, through my words, through the good work that I do. The Komodo dragons want to see that. That masterpiece, that's, that, that, that's Kevin doing what God created him to do. It says that we're created in Christ Jesus, the text says. So it's talking about our first and our second births. Created in, originally by the Lord, but then created our second birth in Christ Jesus. And I've been thinking a lot about Jesus' words. This is a whole other message, but Jesus' words about being born again. We know what he means, conversion whole new birth, something that only the Spirit of God can do. But was Jesus also hinting at what we see in other places of Scripture, the call to be childlike? Was he also hinting at this call to, like, to just become a kid again and just enter into this whole new way? Childlike faith. Creating Christ Jesus for good works. Paul is writing this to the Ephesian church. You know the city of Ephesus, this bustling metropolis, pagan metropolis, all kinds of workers there, silversmiths and bakers and all kinds of people. When Paul is saying this, he doesn't have in mind just nice, like, kind of Christian works and just be nice to someone at church on Sunday. Paul has in mind the church of God all week long. He has in mind the church of God not just on Sunday, but on Monday in their workplaces. The good works that they're created in Christ Jesus to do, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is getting back to that master-servant relationship. This is getting to the second meaning in the title. Going to work confident, because then we say confident, con, Latin, with, fide, faith. With faith. Going to work confident, with faith, that God is at work. Not just that God is there at work, but God is at work. The great worker is working. He's prepared beforehand these works he wants you to work in, and he's still working right now in the midst of this. Jesus has restored this master-servant relationship. This, this whole idea was, this was a breakthrough for the missionary Hudson Taylor. You're probably familiar with him. Great British missionary to China. And Hudson Taylor, my second son, is named after him. He felt this enormous weight of responsibility for the country of China, that the gospel would go forward, that individual lives would be transformed, but also that culture would be transformed there, that injustices in China, the economic systems in China would be transformed. And he, 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 he was one of these guys that struggled with hyper-responsibility, and so I super relate to him because that's, that's, I think, my deepest sin and my deepest wound, and I'm not sure how much of it's sin and how much of it is wounding, but in there there's a ton of pride and there's a ton of wounding in my life. I just feel like I'm hyper-responsible. I've got to kind of figure it out, do it all. Hudson Taylor had this discovery where he realized he had it all backwards. 
He felt this enormous weight of responsibility. He thought he was supposed to do it all. He thought he had to kind of twist God's arm to have the gospel go forward and have the kingdom advance in China. He had this discovery. He came alive to passages of scripture like Ephesians 2.10 and discovered that he, he didn't need to do the twisting. He, he needed to do the trusting. He needed to trust not just in the finished work of Jesus, but in the ongoing work of Jesus. That Jesus was present, that Jesus was with him, that Jesus was working. And one of the things this looked like specifically for Hudson Taylor's life was he made a shift from being need-focused need to opportunity-focused. That's an important shift for us to make. If we are thinking exclusively about the needs of the city of Los Angeles, you're just going to be overwhelmed. There will always be needs. There are so many needs. Needs are everywhere, and we must think about them, must pray about them. But if it's just need, 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 it, it can be very easy, at least it can be very easy for me, to think, I've got to go figure out how to meet all those needs. You're just overwhelmed. Husband Taylor shifted from being need-focused to being opportunity-focused. Okay, what are the opportunities that God is putting in front of me? Where is God at work? What opportunities is he putting in front of me? How can I walk into those opportunities? What would that look like for you to make that shift in your work this week? Less focused on the needs, more focused on opportunities God begins to put in front of you, that God is actively creating opportunities for you to walk into. So to try to sum it up, what am I saying in this, in this message? I think what I'm saying is that when you think about your work, God must become bigger and you must become smaller. When you think about your work, God must become bigger and you must become smaller. This master-servant relationship needs to get retuned. God is a great worker. I'm sure you're a great worker. But God is the great worker. He was working before you ever existed. The first pillar, God the great worker. He created humans. He created you to work. Our Savior first shows up at work. We're a people who can rest in the finished work of Jesus. And we can trust the ongoing work of Jesus, the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, the ongoing work of our Heavenly Father. And we give our God so much glory when we go to work confident that he is at work. It gives him so much glory. And all we have to do, Ephesians 2.10, is walk. You saw what the text said, walk. It's, not, it's the Greek word peripateo just means to walk. We just, we just take the next step. Monday, you, just, you, you take that next step. God's at work. He's creating opportunities for you to walk into. And you take that next step. You walk. And I think that the greatest influence, your greatest influence that you're going to have in your workplace is your confidence that God is at work. You bring a lot of things to the table, all your skills, all your strengths, all your talent, keep doing that. But I think the greatest influence you bring to your workplace is your confidence that God is at work. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group of people before me who, who I don't know, but you know. I thank you for, that they're here. I thank you for their hunger to hear from you, their hunger to steward their influence, their hunger to make an impact, their hunger to see this city rejoice and flourish. Uh, living God, we ask you to do what only you can do uh, in our lives, in our workplace, in our city. Give us eyes to see how big you are, how good you are, and to have our eyes open to the opportunities that you are giving us to walk into. Would you even now, as I'm praying through the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, supernaturally uh, strengthen our confidence in you, in your presence, and in what you're doing. And we pray this in the name of our Savior who finished his work for us on the cross and who is now in heaven interceding for us.
and continuing his work for us. We love you, Jesus. Amen.